Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In this um, this follow-up video, we're going to be talking about um, the connection between ECH, our chemical potential energy, and our tool of energy bar charts that we've introduced in the previous kind of a couple of units ago. Um, so we've looked now at this idea of what a chemical potential energy is and how it kind of relates to chemical change, seeing that energy is an important factor in why chemical reactions do or don't happen. And now we're going to use energy bar charts to try and represent that change a little better. So we in introduced this idea that um, uh, that reactions can be exothermic or endothermic um, in terms of whether energy is required to start them off or energy is released at the other end. Okay, and so we're going to look at this example of the decomposition of sodium hydrogen carbonate to form sodium oxide, carbon dioxide, and water. Now, this was one of those reactions that we needed to heat. So I'm going to actually add to our chemical equation that I've just kind of sketched up the top here, the energy term over here. So energy plus our sodium hydrogen carbonate went to this, this change here. And I've constructed this kind of um, two-part or, or kind of connected um, energy bar chart diagram, so LOL, I suppose, and I've left a bit of space under here because I'm going to jot some notes as we're going um, about some things that we notice. Okay, so we've got reactants when they're cold, the reactants when they're hot, when we've heated them by adding energy in, and then going from here to form our products. Okay, and so um, I also want to, I'm going to go down here and do our reactants, and then kind of kind of sketch the diagram over here that, that we kind of see. All right, so let's say we start off with, um, so, so now we're actually going to use our CH account over here, ECH. Now I am going to, at this point, ignore the um, phase account because we're not, you know, the phase change aspect is not the most important aspect of where the energy is being used today. So we're just going to mainly focus on the thermal and chemical to try and keep things straightforward. Okay, so let's say we start with our reactants with a, at room temperature with a certain amount of chemical potential energy. Okay, so this is kind of our mid, mid range. All right, so then what's going to happen is that to go from cold to hot, then we're going to have to add in um, two bars of energy by heating. Now, the reason is okay, well, why do we need to heat it at all? What's the purpose here? Is that um, when we're getting um, rearranging atoms comes from, um, stems from collisions. So re it requires collisions between molecules, okay? That they can't, we can't rearrange the atoms if the particles are nowhere near each other. They need to physically bump into each other with sufficient energy um, for that, for them, that, to, that then we're going to, be breaking and making breaking those bonds to make new ones. So we need we need require, require collisions, um, and we need they need to be high energy collisions. So high impact. Okay, if they just nudge into each other, then it's not going to be enough. Okay, and so and when we have more thermal energy, that is kinetic energy of the particles. Um, we get more collisions. Okay, that's the essence of it here. That we get more collisions, and those collisions that we do have tend to have more energy involved in them. So when we make it hot, we have a better chance of those collisions making it work. So what we've done, we've added in two bars of thermal energy in um, to make our reactants at a higher temperature. Okay, so we've got four bars here. Now what happens is that we've got some you know fast moving, so energetic collisions collisions lead to rearrangement or leads to new bonds forming. Okay? Now what's the, the thing that's interesting about this is that um, so we've we've gone through our energetic collisions and we have by the, that collision then that we've reached the point where they're all all our bonds are broken. And now we're going to come back down to form our products. Okay? But the way what happens is that once we've gotten these reactants hot, that then we don't actually need any outside input um, for uh, we don't need to add more energy. That we've made them energetic enough so that when the collision happens, that what happens is that some bars of our thermal energy transfer to our chemical energy. So we end up with cooler 
slower moving particles in our products that have higher stored energy than our reactants did. So we have more bars of chemical energy here than we did here, which represents the difference that we have over here. Okay, so seeing that our products have higher stored energy than our reactants did. Um, and we had to put energy in by making the reactants hot in order for us to get, to have enough collisions to get there. Okay, so the energy that we put in that made the reactants go from cold to hot then meant that the collisions had a sufficient energy, pardon me, to then form new products. So here, so we had no energy change in this particular uh, part of the diagram. Okay, it was all, it was just an internal transfer from one account to the other account by the particles of the system colliding with one another. It didn't relate to the surroundings at all. Okay, now we're going to have a look at an exothermic example. So we're now going to consider the combustion of methane. Okay, now, so we know, so this is methane is the main component of natural gas. So we can recognize straight away that this is an exothermic reaction. It gives off energy to the surroundings. Okay, so whereas in the previous example we put energy, a, an energy term over here, and we're now going to be able to consider it over here as though it was one of the products that's given off. That as we change from methane and oxygen gas into carbon dioxide and water, that then excess energy is released into the surroundings. Okay, so we've set up the same sort of idea of a conjoined um, LOL diagram, energy bar chart diagram, but the labels are slightly different, that we have reactants, we have products now, and then products later. Okay, so this is kind of as soon as the products are made and then at some time later. Okay, so what we can recognise is that um, when we have energy that's, um, so, so when we have energy being given out as a result, that we, we already identified that our products store less energy than our reactants do. And so remember that that energy storage in terms of the particles themselves is being represented by our chemical energy. So that means that our chemical energy must be higher here than it is here. Okay, so let's make sure, let's represent that and say, let's say that this is a really high amount of chemical energy, four bars. Okay, so that the arrangement of the particles Energy being used in the, the connections within the particle, the bonding within the particles is really high here and then is lower here. Okay, now that this um, energy change has to kind of go somewhere. But the idea is that we've got particles that collide straight away. And so um, what happens is that we start off with particles that are, um, that are room temperature. Now, at this stage, we're ignoring the fact that to get this lit, that you need a tiny bit of energy from a match, okay? We're, we're, we're not really going to, that's not the big issue here, so we'll, we'll try to ignore that at this point. So that we have start with a fairly, you know, moderate sort of temperature, they're, they're fairly moving fairly slowly, but what happens is that we're going to do another internal transfer, that the energy that is being stored in, in the bonds inside, or, you know, been stored in the bonding within that particle, when they collide to make new particles, that then we end up with very hot, fast-moving particles. Okay, so there's no in or out from the surroundings here. But now what we have is that we've got new product molecules that have less energy in their, stored in their bonding, but more energy stored in their motion. But we know that because of the idea of thermal equilibrium, that if the particles are hotter than their surroundings, that then that event and eventually that energy will be lost to the surroundings from the system. So our products still have two stored bars of chemical energy at some time later, but that two, we've, we've cooled back down to room temperature. So we've lost two bars of energy, thermal energy, which remember is the account that it goes in and out of straight away. We've lost that for it to return to the room temperature that starts with. Okay, so, what we, we say is reactants have more energy stored in their bonds, in, in their, the bonding, than the products. And we get energy transfer to surroundings. via 
our thermal account, remember, which is the only one that we can go in and out of, okay, from the surroundings in the system. Okay, so we did an internal transfer during the collision to make the new substances, and then with those, those hot up, faster moving particles, we lose energy to the surroundings. Okay, so which is why we started off with reactants, and after going up a tiny little hill, we've dropped right down to less stored energy in our products. Okay, um, I realize that this is, this is a pretty hard idea to understand, and it will take a fair bit of thinking, so I really want you to take the time to, to consider your notes as you work through um, the next worksheet. Okay, and to try and consider, right, well, where is the energy going at each stage? Okay, is energy being put in at the start, or is energy being given off at the end? Okay, because that's a first kind of key idea to be able to understand that um, is it an exothermic or endothermic process? Um, so then, and putting the energy term in the equation, getting used to that sort of mentality, and then thinking about, okay, well then, what are the kind of the what's the breakdown of the stages accordingly? Because you saw that the exothermic reaction and endothermic reaction, that the energy interchange, the moving of bars around, um, is different, but that exo and endothermic reactions are fairly consistent. Okay, so if you can identify what type of reaction it is, then you can typically use the bar charts to explain it. Okay, um, but in you know, getting to this idea of how much energy is being used in the, the bonding within the particle, um, and that we need to break all the bonds first before we can make new ones, and that energy is involved in breaking all the bonds to begin with, um, but that then, depending on whether we have more stored in the products or less stored in the products, dictates whether energy, the net energy change is into the system or out of it, to the surroundings. Okay, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.